Thank you, Jan, um, and for, yes, for indeed for setting up some of the things I'll be talking about. Um, so, so, yes, yeah, so when I saw the list of topics that were being going to be discussed uh, at this meeting, uh, I thought uh, I really should talk about, um, on this topic, which some of you have, have heard me talk about before, relativistic causality in Bell's theorem. But as I said, I mean, I think it, it, it gets to the heart of, of this question of is the universal local or non-local? Um, and, and also, although I don't, I don't think I'll really have time to talk about this, some of these other um, issues like how to interpret the no-signal no theorem and what is the future of scientific explanation. Okay, but then on the other hand, because... Um, oh, oh, right, that's right, this is not working, is it? This one. Um, oh, yeah, so, 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 sorry. So, yeah, so for people who don't know, I'm at Griffith University, which is uh, here in Brisbane, Australia, uh, in the Centre for Quantum Dynamics. Okay, so as I was saying, but uh, on the other hand, because this uh, is also the very special meeting being the Bohm Centenary, uh, I was uh, realised that, that I really would like to say something about this, uh, David Bohm's legacy for the future of quantum physics. Uh, so I'm going to sneak in just a few slides uh, before I get to the main topic, which is what my abstract will say I'm talking about, uh, to talk about uh, progress on the many interacting worlds approach to quantum mechanics. Uh, and so this little bit of work here is, is work uh, that I've done with uh, Michael Hall and Moji Kadima at Griffith University and uh, Dirk Andre Deckert at uh, LMU. <laughs> Um, okay, so what does this have to do with Bohmian mechanics or, or David Bohm? Well, you'll see in a minute. Um, so th this is work that, uh, at least in, in my sense, began uh, when, with this paper we published in 2014 uh, on modelling quantum phenomena by, as interactions between many classical worlds. Uh, and so to briefly explain how this arises, this idea, uh, the Bohm's original dynamics was Newton's dynamics, basically, second order dynamics, uh, plus a conservative quantum force uh, for a uh, variable x, a vector, say, uh, which I'll call the world configuration. So it's the, the position of all the particles in the world, um, and so that lives in a very large configuration space. Uh, so in this world, then, this extra quantum force comes from a quantum potential, uh, which is local in this, uh, in this configuration sense. Of course, it's not local in the um, general sense. So it's a local functional of the, the modulus squared of the wave function in this configuration space. Uh, and what this, the nature of this potential, the reason that, that, uh, that uh, Bohmian mechanics works is that the, this potential is such that if you consider the virtual ensemble of worlds which were distributed originally according to the um, mod psi squared distribution, then under the action of this uh, potential or force, it will remain mod psi squared distrib distributed at all times. Um, okay, but once you realize that, it seems like an obvious question to say, why not, instead of thinking about this virtual ensemble, actually consider a real ensemble, so a very large ensemble, in other words, a very large number of elements uh, of worlds, as I'll call them, so actual points in this configuration space, uh, and instead of considering uh, some quantum potential which comes from mod psi squared, uh, rather consider some sort of force which is actually a function of nearby worlds in this configuration sense, because you've got uh, the mod size squared in a sense is represented by this real ensemble of worlds. Um, okay, so in other words, this, the idea here was to derive quantum uh, phenomena from many interacting classical worlds uh, with no wave function fundamentally in the formalism. And so that in this theory, probabilities would arise purely from a classical ignorance about which of the worlds we are living in um, and founded on a principle of indifference between all the possible worlds. Okay, so uh, what we uh, did in, back in 2014 was introduce a toy model for this, so just a one particle in one dimension uh, and a very simple interaction between neighboring worlds. So this is a three-body interaction of each world, uh, so uh, the total potential being a sum of potentials over um, between a world and its world on either side uh, of this particular form here. Uh, and we were able to show a number of things numerically and analytically, like the existence of ground states, 
Uh, and but uh, yeah, most um, appealingly graphically, we were able to reproduce uh, quantum interference phenomena. So this is uh, these are these are Bohmian uh, lines. This is a virtual Bohmian uh, ensemble, if you like. This is what one ordinary sees. The sort of thing that Basil uh, put up just in the last talk. Um, so these are trajectories guided by the wave function, uh, and these are trajectories guided by the nearby trajectories according to the, the world. So no wave function was used in the generation of um, the, the dynamics which you see over here, but qualitatively we have pretty good agreement. Okay, so, um, so yeah, that was all very nice, um, but what we thought would be relatively straightforward um, turned out to be in the intervening years to be rather um, difficult, so but I thought it'd be good to give an update. Um, what we completely were unable to do with that original toy model was to, to reproduce excited states. So this is just a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, we've actually fixed all these out, well, a bunch of these outside worlds, and we're just looking at the inner region where there's a node. Uh, and what we would like, of course, is for that node to be stable over time. Uh, but what we find is uh, evolving according to that uh, toy potential is that that node very quickly collapses. Uh, and yeah, so that, that was bad. Um, so, but finally, I, I wanted to put up this very recent results which we got, which was a generalizing that, that uh, three body interaction to in general a two M plus one body interaction. So each world interacting with an uh, uh, M worlds on either side of it, um, directly like this, and with, with certain coefficients here which you have to uh, work out. Um, and then, whoops, so yeah, so then the toy model corresponds to m equals one, uh, and what we've, we've just very recently got is what looks like um, the, the, a, a stable node uh, appearing in the dynamic. So I just, I thought, as I said, I'd give you that update. Uh, and um, just to say that, yes, David Bohm's legacy is, is still uh, very much having an influence on um, new approaches to quantum mechanics uh, as we're doing here. Okay. Getting on to then the, the actual topic of my talk, uh, relativistic causality in Bell's theorem. Uh, I want to say that this work is uh, partly in collaboration with uh, Eric Cavalcanti, who's now with me also at Griffith University, uh, but when we uh, worked on this paper uh, was at the University of Sydney. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is what I'm going to call the two Bell's theorems of John Bell. Uh, and why there's an ongoing debate about Bell's theorems because of this. Uh, then a, a way to get, uh, I'll propose a resolution by going back to basics in the way we think about Bell's theorem, in particular by talking about the notion of causation. Uh, and so to show that then that uh, talking about a common cause allows a common formulation. Uh, and then I'll conclude, uh, and then I won't talk about all the stuff that I won't have time to talk about. Okay. All right, so the two Bell's theorems. The first Bell's theorem uh, is, of course, the one in 1964. And if you say, well, what did, um, what did Bell actually prove then? Well, I think Bell put it perfectly clearly in the paper. This is from, from the paper in a theory in which parameters, I'll read it off here, uh, are added to quantum mechanics to determine the results of individual measurements without changing the statistical predictions. There must be a mechanism whereby the setting of one measuring device can influence the reading of another instrument, however remote. Okay? So I think what, what's very clear in this is that there are two components to the theorem, or two assumptions in the theorem, uh, from which you can derive a contradiction with quantum uh, phenomena. Uh, and they are the assumption of predetermination. This is a word that Bell uses in his paper, which is this, in, indeed this idea about parameters determining the results of individual measurements. Um, and the other thing, so here stated there's the negation, right, that the idea that the setting of one measuring device can influence the reading of another, uh, is the negation of locality, which Bell states in this paper, is that the result of a measurement on one system be unaffected by operations on a different distant system. Okay, so uh, the, what's... So this is where I would disagree with Jan, saying that there are only three papers about non-locality that you have to read, wherever Jan is. Um, I would say that you should definitely also read uh, Bell's paper in Epistemological Letters in 1976, uh, because in this, um, so again, this is a quote from the paper, uh, he's introducing a new notion of local causality, 
uh, which is that events in one lab should, be, should not be causes of events in a space like separated lab. But this does not mean that the two sets of events should be uncorrelated, for they could have common causes in their backward light cones. Okay. Um, this is, yeah, then this is uh, the statement of the theorem then. Um, well, sorry, a statement, a more clear statement of local causality. A consequence of local causality is that the outcomes in the two labs are having no statistical dependence on one another nor on the settings. Okay, so this is a crucial difference from the notion of locality that he talked about in 1964 because he's now talking about the outcomings, outcomes having no dependence on one another, not just about outcomes not having dependence on the settings. Okay. Um, okay, so they so he's saying that local causality means they don't have this dependence, they only have uh, local, they only have dependence on the local measurement settings uh, and the past causes. Okay, and so the theorem then in 1976 is that quantum mechanics give certain correlations which cannot be re reproduced by locally causal theory. So to, um, yeah, for, for, for those who, who are not familiar with it, um, probably very few people, but um, and assuming that you are from, familiar with the Minkowski diagram, so that, that narrows down the possible people who'll get anything from this quite a lot. But nevertheless, uh, this is the classic setup for the Bell's theorem. So we have Alice's lab over here. This is time going up here, Bob's lab over there. Uh, Alice makes a setting choice at some time here, uh, which is space like separated from Bob's outcome. And likewise, so these, these diagonal lines are the light, uh, light lines. Uh, I have a, a source tip down here, which is somehow responsible for the outcomes which, uh, which come up here. So uh, naturally, these are the, the elements of, this, uh, of the setup, right? If you go into the laboratory, you can actually see macroscopic things corresponding to these. Uh, and if you uh, believed in local physics or relativistic physics in some way, you'd expect that you would have causal influences like this. Um, and you might admit that there could be other things. So this is a space like hypersurface. Um, there could be other variables that are not visible when you go into the lab, but they could be there, uh, which could have influences as, as well, like this. So what Bell's 1964 theorem says is that if these influences that I've done in green here, if all of the influences tell you what predetermines the outcomes, B and the outcomes A, uh, then you can only explain what we observe in quantum mechanics if you postulate an additional influence, an additional causal influence like this, or an additional determination from, for example, Bob's settings to Alice's outcome, or, or of course vice versa, or both. Okay. Uh, whereas Bell's 1976 theorem doesn't talk specifically about that and doesn't talk about predetermination, it just says that if these are the causes, okay, that is incompatible with uh, the predictions of quantum mechanics. Okay, so again, just to make it very, very clear what I'm talking about, the difference. Um, so I'm talking about a phenomena, uh, of, to begin with, make a distinction between a phenomenon and a theory. So a phenomenon means something you can observe. So there would be observed probabilities only involving these macroscopic things, outcomes, settings, and the, the source. Uh, whereas a theory postulates these additional variables, alpha, beta, gamma, which we can just wrap up into lambda here, okay? So a theory uh, describes a phenomenon if I can get this observed probabilities from the theoretical probabilities like that. So predetermination means that the probabilities of the outcomes are zero or one, okay? Just given all the things they can depend on, including the lambdas, um, you can only have one possible outcome, and, and this is related to something Jan was talking about this morning, that predetermination is not the same as predictability, okay, it doesn't mean that the observed outcomes, of course, have to be, uh, have probability zero or one given the observed settings, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so locality, as I read it from Bell's 1964 paper, is that the probability of Alice's results, depending on um, the, the hidden variables, uh, Alice's setting, the source, and Bob's setting does not actually depend on Bob's setting. Okay, and but again, it's, it's important to make a distinction. That's not the same thing as no fast and light signaling, which is like this but doesn't involve the hidden variables. Okay, 
Um, so Bell's 1964 theorem then is that there's no theory reproducing quantum phenomena satisfying these two things, locality and predetermination. Whereas Bell's 1976 theorem involves a uh, concept of local causality, which where you look at everything on Bob's side as a potential cause, in, including Bob's outcome, right? Uh, and just say that no, it can't depend on either of those. So, so we get an equation like this, and obviously the same the other way. And Bell's 1976 theorem is simply that there is right, no theory reproducing quantum phenomena satisfying local causality. Um, so all of this, um, you, you know, from the very beginning, we're really assuming uh, another concept which Bell named in 1990 as no superdeterminism, which is just to say that the probability of those hidden variables on that space-like hypersurface prior to the settings do not depend on those settings. Okay, that, that, that's, it, it, oh, yeah, well, Alice's, for example, yeah, it only depends on the source. Okay. Um, all right, so that seems to make everything clear. Uh, there are two Bell's theorems, um, and you can take your pick. Um, but unfortunately, things very quickly got uh, confused again, because even in 1976, after he introduced the term local causality, in that very same paper, uh, Bell used the word locality as a synonym for it, even though in my reading, uh, he'd used, in 1964, he used locality to mean something different. Uh, and then soon afterwards, Bell started claiming explicitly that by locality he had always meant local causality, okay? And that this was a sacred principle which Einstein had believed in, for example. So followers of Bell then often say that Bell's theorem just means that quantum phenomena are non-local, uh, whereas a lot of physicists, probably most physicists, not in this room, but generally, uh, only know about Bell's 1964 theorem uh, and say that we can keep locality simply by giving up predetermination. So, uh, so I would call these, these two uh, camps, the realist camp and the operationalist camp, respectively. And Bell was certainly in the realist camp. You can see here is holding up a real wave function. Um, <laughs> So, and I, I think this, this sums it up. Uh, so these are not his act, exact words, but I, I believe this represents his, his opinion and those of the followers, uh, is that my theorem uses only one assumption, local causality or locality, as we might call it for short. This is the only non-piddling way, that's a quote, um, to define the principle of relativity for statistical theories. It is essentially what EPR assumed in 1935 uh, they showed that operational quantum mechanics is non-local, and I showed in 1964 that adding hidden variables cannot solve the problem. Experiments have thus proven uh, the principle of relativity false, the world is non-local. Whereas an operationalist, um, and because I, I don't want to be accused of you know, putting words in the mouth, operationalists, it's hard to get a good quote from operationalists, so, so you might think this is a straw man, but Anyway, um, Bell's theorem uses two assumptions. The first assumption is locality. This means no signaling faster than light, which is all the principle of relativity implies, uh, even for hidden variable theories. Operational quantum mechanics respects locality. The second assumption is uh, realism or classicality or predetermination or something else. Clearly, it is this second assumption that we should abandon whatever we call it. Locality is here to stay. Okay, all right, so, wow, okay, I'll speed up. All right, so um, how can we reconcile these two camps, the realist and the operationalist? My suggestion is that we have to really go back to, to basics uh, and be, uh, yeah, introduce more concepts rather than equations. So, uh, so to begin with, I'm gonna list things called axioms, which don't mean that, that they're unquestionable, but just means that I'm gonna take them as unquestioned for this talk. So the first axiom is macroreality, which is just that, uh, you know, any observer observes this real single event, that's a, a real thing and it's not relative to anything else. Uh, second axiom, basically the existence of Minkowski space-time, which is the concepts which we are talking about, like uh, light cones, space-time variables, space-like separated, etc., that can be applied unambiguously. So basically this is, this, this is more or less ruling out many worlds, this is more or less mo ruling out uh, wormholes. Uh, axiom three, uh, temporal, temporal order. For any space-time variable A, there is a space-like surface, hypersurface containing A that separates events in the past of A from events that have A in their past. Uh, so, 
I want to be careful when I introduce a yellow word here, that means that I'm not assuming that it has a meaning, that its meaning is actually going to emerge from these axioms and principles and things. Okay. Um, uh, and axiom four, causal arrow, which says that any cause of a space-time variable is another space-time variable in its past. Again, I'm not, I haven't assumed a meaning for cause, I'm just introducing that uh, as a word whose meaning will become, uh, acquire, be acquired as we put up more principles. Okay, but these things here guarantee that there are no causal loops, okay? So, so um, yeah, you don't have to accept this, but those are the axioms I'm working with. Okay, so then we get on to postulates, all right? So these are the, yeah, things which are perhaps more questionable. Um, free choice. So a freely chosen action has no causes, or at least no causes that we need to worry about. Um, boom, boom, boom. Relativ relativistic causality now is being specific that, to say that the past is the past light cone. Okay, that, that's what we would mean by relativistic causality. Um, common causes, right, okay, this is an important one, postulate of common causes. If two sets of space-time variables are correlated and no space-time variable in either is a cause of any space-time variable in the other, then they must have a set of common causes that explains the correlation. Okay, so here we have another yellow word, explains. What, what do we mean by that? Well, here's one thing that we could mean by that, this postulate, which I'm calling decorrelating explanation, is that uh, when you have this situation, the, the, the common causes C explains the correlation only if conditioning on the value of C always eliminates the correlation. Okay, so if you know the value of the common cause, then you no longer have a correlation because you would know exactly what that cause is. There's nothing to be averaged over to, to give a correlation. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, those, uh, taking the axioms of given, those postulates, uh, as I, I uh, wrote down those last four postulates, are sufficient to derive Bell's um, inequality, for example, and so it's sufficient to get a contradiction with quantum phenomena. Right, so I haven't got time to explain exactly how that works. It involves various other things on the way down. Um, but why this is, I think this is a useful thing is that these list of four things at the top is something that both operationalists and realists could learn to live with. So the original operationalist version of Bell's theorem, the one that operationalists like, Bell's 1964 theorem, makes these assumption implicitly of no superdeterminism, certainly of locality and of predetermination. Uh, to get this contradiction. So the point is that the operationalists want to keep locality, um, and they can do that with these, with these um, assumptions up here if they say, well, the one that we reject is this decorrelating explanation. Okay, they say, why should we think that you know, this classical idea of what it means to explain something should be valid uh, in general, but I can still believe in these other things, relative is causality, free choice, and common causes, uh, and in particular that means that I can still hold on to locality. Uh, whereas uh, the realist version, um, again, the original realist version just assumes local causality and no superindeterminism to derive the contradiction. Uh, but one can get to that same conclusion uh, by starting with these four at the top and saying, okay, the, the thing that we uh, throw away is going to be relative is causality, okay? That that's really where the, what the, the point that the realists have to ultimately get to. They say, we want to keep this notion of scientific explanation, what it means to explain things, and we, we uh, just uh, have to face the fact that relative is causality is the thing that has to be given up. Uh, and so locality just doesn't come into it then. Okay, so, uh, so to summarize, um, so there are, as I would claim, actually two Bell's theorems, the 1964 one and the 1976 one. Uh, they have essentially the same proof, uh, but they have different assumptions. Uh, so the 1964 one favored by operationalists, the 1976 one favored by realists. Um, and that by considering the notions of based on causation, uh, we can, I think, understand why the two camps disagree about how to formulate Bell's theorem, find the ball, form of Bell's theorems that both should be able to agree upon. Uh, we can, if you want, avoid the contentious word locality altogether by talking about more fundamental things. Um, and then there, there are a bunch of other um, advantages as I see it. I, I think um, we're going to hear something about no fine tuning on another day uh, from Matt Leifer. Um, but 
Yeah, I I'll think I'll just leave it there and leave time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Howard.